Representative Summer Lee of Pennsylvania is, I think it's fair to say, one of the most proudly progressive members of Congress. Elected in 2022, she quickly joined the squad and quickly got attacked by the right. In the wake of October the 7th, Representative Lee co-sponsored one of the first resolutions in Congress calling for a ceasefire. And last week, despite being targeted by a pro-Israel billionaire and GOP mega-donor, she won her primary race for the Democratic nomination by a pretty wide margin. Congresswoman Summer Lee joins me now. Thank you so much for coming on Mehdi Unfiltered today. I appreciate it. I'm excited. Thanks for having me. So, Congressman, when you look at the tough race that you just ran in your district, how do you think you managed to win such an impressive victory against a billionaire-backed Democratic primary opponent, Bhavani Patel. You went from narrowly winning your primary in 2022, I think, by 1,000 votes, less, less. to winning it by 20,000 votes this time. How? Well, I think that, right, we're not new to this. You know, I've since 2018, when I first ran for the state house, I have uh, had to go up against uh, different folks, always from the right. Mm -hmm. uh, since 2022, it's been, you know, a different, you know, billionaire, Republican billionaire, you know, backpack. So we've, we, we have a blueprint. But also, you know, we've been working. I think a lot of people really took for granted. You know, we say, oh, there's an incumbent advantage, but we don't actually talk about what that incumbent, you know, advantage is. And for us, it was the movement that we have been building, the electorate movement, electoral movement in Western Pennsylvania for the last six or so years where every cycle we have been organizing, yeah. we've expanded the electorate, we have been offering people in this put region. In. Put the work in. And we put it in every single day, not just on the electoral side, we put the work in on the, on, on the political side or, or on the official side, right? Where we served our constituents. We did the, the, the basic traditional politics as, as well as the organizing work and we combined all of those things. So I think it made it very difficult for people to come in and try to brand us when we had already done the work to brand ourselves. What do you say to your critics who say you won because of low turnout? It was the lowest turnout primary race, I think, since 2018 in that district, which gave you as the incumbent a big advantage. That's so sweet. Um, <laughs> first of all, we've, I've won in low turnout and I've won in high turnout. I've won with millions of dollars spent against me and I've won uh, where I've outspent other people. Uh, the common denominator is, is that we win. The common denominator is that we do the work to bring out our people. We do the work to put out our positive message and people relate to it and people are excited Excited by it. Uh, I would argue, and I think that a lot of people would probably join us, is that if turnout were higher, we'd probably have a higher margin because the type of folks who did not turn out are a lot of folks who are a part of our coalition. We had folks who are tired, you know, we have black and brown and young folks and progressive folks who maybe did not turn out at the same rate that they did last time. But indeed, people who are on the other side turned out at higher rates. Uh, so I say do a deeper dive. Okay. So <laughs> We'll talk about the millions spent against you in a moment. Just before we get to that, you won big in Westmoreland County, which is a big Trump-supporting county, a county you lost in the primary two years ago. How did you reach out to more conservative, white working class, Trumpier voters, uh, being a black, female, progressive, pro-Palestinian squad member? How, <laughs> what's the secret? Oh, this is going to be controversial. Well, the secret is that it was a Democratic primary, so we reached out to the Democrats. Uh, but no, but we served everybody. We have a, a satellite office, right, on, on our constituent services side. We have a satellite office where we've been working, you know, for the last year, uh, right over in Jeanette, the furthest uh, distance you can get away from the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, but we've also been working with some of the local Democratic groups. Uh, there is like a cool group of just like Democratic women who have been doing work around saving libraries. They've been doing work about, you know, protecting our like a abortion rights and things yeah. of that nature. So we just tapped into the networks that they already had. We served them, we, we uh, lifted each other up, and we did this work together. It's not rocket science. It isn't. Kudos okay. to them, though, because they did great. The pro-Israel group APAC, which scares a lot of people in your party, stayed out of your race this time round, even though they spent, I think, $5 million to try and stop you in 2022. Why do you think they stayed out, and how much did that help you? So um, they did not stay out. Right? I love that characterization. I think it's important that we are very specific. Okay. They did not stay out. Uh, they recruited openly in my district where they you know, reached out to a number of my colleagues from the state house and other uh, local officials to try, and, and to, to try to get them a run. They promised them millions of dollars if they were to do so. They ran 
you know, terrible negative ads around uh, October 7th and beyond in my district in the earlier days after uh, after that date. Um, and they polled extensively in my district regularly, which means that they actually did spend money. What they found in those polls is that they could not win. So what they did was is they, they went home and they saved a couple of dollars so they can then go and attack the rest of our pro and peace champions. And they claim 100% victory And record. then they claim 100% victory, which is also not true because they lost in California as well. So, okay, APEC directly wasn't backing a candidate against you, but they tried, as you say. There was a pro-Israel uh, billionaire, GOP mega donor, Jeff Yass, a recent Trump business ally, yeah. uh, investor in Truth Social, who spent, I think, almost a million dollars at least trying to unseat you in this race. What message do you think it sends to your fellow Democrats running for office across the country that you were able to beat APEC's dollars in 2022 and Jeff Yass's dollars in 2024? I think that authenticity matters. I think that the voters of our party are looking to go in a more progressive direction. When we are able to get out our message, when we are doing the work, when we're organizing, when we're activating our base, when we're building the coalitions of the future, not just playing into the coalitions of the past, we find that more people actually want to participate. We find that more people actually have hope for what's possible within our party and, 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 our, and, and, and our government. But we don't do that enough. You know, people in Western Pennsylvania remember when APAC came two years ago. They remember what it felt like to live through those negative ads that never mentioned Israel, but were a lot of, dis a lot of disinformation, a lot of uh, distortion, and they didn't like it. We don't want those type of influences in our politics. And we know from Western it's, Pennsylvania- It's funny they don't run pro-Israel ads. They never it's almost like they know But not only do they unpopular. not run pro-Israel ads, they don't run ads that are truthful about our progressive records, right? They always have to distort. If we're, if we're talking about budgets, it's, you know, they did a lot of, oh, well, she didn't support Biden. And they tried to say that it was a Biden budget or, or, or the Biden debt ceiling bill. And we know that that's not true because that's just not how uh, a Republican held majority works. But they have to take those sorts of uh, stances because it's the only thing that they have. When they polled in our district and they talked about uh, housing or Medicare for all or a Green New Deal, they saw that even in what they thought was blue dog dim Western Pennsylvania post-industrialized... People want health care. People want health care. Shock. Um, <laughs> Throughout this campaign, you've been very vocal on Gaza, the need for a ceasefire, for more humanitarian aid. You've been very critical of Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, you even wore a kafaya to the State of the Union. Uh, are there other House Democrats, I wonder, who tell you in private that they're with you, they agree with you on this issue, but they're too afraid to speak out? Is there a disconnect, I wonder, between what we see members of Congress say in public about Israel-Palestine and what they acknowledge about it in private? I think there's some of that. Certainly. You know, I think that there are, I, I mean, even without them having to say it, you, you wouldn't have to say it. I think that there are a number of people who represent districts where Israel is not the top 20 issue, right? Mm -hmm. These are not people who came and grew up, uh, you know, learning about Zionism. These are people who came and they understood that to keep their seats or to get their seat in the first place, that they had to attract money, they had to keep money out of their races. And that's why our races are important, right? That's why they were looking to see what happened to me in Western Pennsylvania. They're looking to see what happens with Jamal yeah. and with Corey because they want to know, is there a pathway for us to, to free ourselves, to free our party, you know, from Netanyahu, right, who we know is a right-wing extremist. Yeah. He doesn't even align with the Democratic Party. So I think that that is absolutely a, a dynamic. I wonder if we'll see what happens to the Israel lobby in the same way that we saw what happened to the gun lobby which is totally not bipartisan anymore. It's basically a Republican front group, and APAC in many ways has become that as well. The Democrats haven't quite caught up. We haven't, but we know that uh, APAC has endorsed over 200 uh, anti-choice uh, politicians right now. While the Democratic Party is making, you know, Roe v. Wade is, is making abortion care and access, the biggest issue in 2024, well, we also have to contend at the same time with the fact that one of their their greatest friends or, or, or proclaimed allies are actually working against them actively through their donors and through uh, the, 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 the people on the right who they are supporting. We can't have it both ways. One very uh, prominent pro-Israel Democrat is Senator John Fetterman of your uh, state of Pennsylvania, your Commonwealth, who ran as a progressive but now recoils from that label. Uh, he actually endorsed you in this race. Uh, would you endorse him for re-election when it's his turn? Because he's upset a lot of people in your base, a lot of young people, a lot of activists mocking them, uh, people who knocked on doors for him. He's attacked them, attacked pro-Palestinian activists. Would you endorse him back? Is he running in five years? 
Listen, this is going to be the most political answer that I'm going to give you, uh, but it's also not even a political answer. He doesn't even have a race for five years. Right now, we are fighting for the heart and the soul of our democracy. We have so much to worry about before we get there. Okay. But also, we have a lot of work to do to make more people come over to our side. So let me, let me not ask you a campaign question. Let me ask you a substantive <laughs> question. When Senator Fetterman says, as he recently did on CNN, that President Biden shouldn't, quote, panda to what he says is the fringe of the Democratic Party on Gaza, and that pandering to that fringe, to people like you, yep. who are calling for a ceasefire, <laughs> quote, empowers Hamas. That's what he says you're doing. What do you say to him, to your Democratic senator? Oh, I your... think it's incredibly insulting. You know, there, there are no, no men's words about that. I think that is incredibly insulting. I think that as somebody who represents the same neighborhood, I, I'm from North Braddock, right? Braddock's neighboring community. My family's from Braddock. So I, I know the folks in that area too. And as somebody who just had to run an election post October 7th, I've spent my time talking to Jewish uh, constituents. I've talked to the Muslim and the Palestinian and the Arab ones. I've talked to, to black and young and brown ones and progressive ones. And we are not the fringe at all. If folks were to open their eyes and actually listen to what people in our, not just district, right, not just state, country, yes. what they're saying, they would see that truly those people who believe that Netanyahu has carte blanche to do whatever he wants, that the civilian casualty rate is not concerning, the people who believe John that Biden. all Palestinians are connected to Hamas or terrorists or abhorrent, that it is a dangerous rhetoric that we see has direct impacts on the, live, on the lives, the safety of Muslims, of Arabs, the Palestinians, and those people who are perceived to be those. We're also throwing around the Hamas label in a very dangerous way. I look at Ilhan Everybody. Omar, Rashida Tlaib, yourself, you know, black and brown women being tarred as Hamas, including by colleagues of yours in the Democratic Party like John Fetterman. That puts a target on your back. Absolutely. We're talking about the members of Congress who probably outside of leadership uh, have the most death threats or, or, or just otherwise threats against our house, our livelihoods, our families, things of that nature. And they know this, right? We're not Hamas. But also, it's not about us. The reason why they need to connect our pro-peace, our majoritarian stance to Hamas yes. is because they're losing yes. the plot, right? It's because they're losing the narrative battle. So they need to redirect to make people think, oh, well, if you believe that Palestinians deserve self-determination, that they don't deserve to be indiscriminately bombed or starved, that you must be Hamas. Have you spoken to John Fetterman about any of this? So let's keep on talking about some of the smears that are out there. A bunch of Democrats in the House and Senate, including John Fetterman, but many more than him, have attacked pro-Palestine protesters on campus as being anti-Semitic, as being pro-Hamas. I know you visited the University of Pittsburgh in your uh, area. What did you see there? Do you see people, uh, do you agree with people who say that these student protesters are anti-Semitic? I think that what we've seen throughout history around particularly student protests is this inclination to point out uh, what actually is the fringe, right? The, the few people who in a large tapestry hold divergent and diverse uh, perspectives and ideas. But if we're focusing on what the student organizers have said that they yeah. are standing for, if we're focusing on what the large majority of the actual students are, it is pro-peace, it is a calling an end to the indiscriminate bombings, the targeting, making sure that the folks who are now refuge, seeking refuge in Rafa are no longer in danger. That's what we've been, that's what they've been saying. And when I went to the University of Pittsburgh, which is but one university, it was but one encampment, I met students who were peaceful. I met students who had, uh, in the center of their encampment, they had a tent that was a medic tent, they had food, but they also had literature. Right, so that they can educate each other, that they can educate other students who might walk past on what they what they're there for not on the, the history. Not the images we hear or see on television. Not at all. That's not what I saw, right? But you see what you you, you get what you're looking for, and a lot of people are yes. looking for students uh, or, or for people who are protesting to be chaotic, or they're expecting them to be violent. But that's not actually what's happening on the ground until violence is brought into so, them by police on and that others. Note, what was your gut reaction? What was your first thought when you saw the images of police uh, violently dispersing protesters on Columbia campus on Tuesday night? I thought it was incredibly dystopian. I thought it was shameful. I think we're looking at a generation of students who grew up in an era where they feared in their core that a, a, a gunman would come onto their campus, onto their schools, and unleash hell on them. They see some of them have lived through it, yeah. and then for them to be met with that sort of militarized uh, reaction and response, that sort of violent response for for students who are 
engaging in the time-honored tradition of student protests and, yes, occupying buildings. We've seen it throughout the civil rights movement. We've seen it in the anti-apartheid movement, both in the United States and in South Africa. Yeah. And this is not new. These tactics are not new. But this reaction really is an indicator that we have lost the plot in the United States. We're more concerned about the occupation of buildings than Palestinian land. Um, let me ask you this. What do you think the Gaza situation, both the mass killings over there and the crackdowns on protesters protesting against uh, the Gaza killings here at home, what does that all mean for President Biden's re-election chances? Because the president, the leader of your party, your candidate, he was already doing pretty badly with 18 to 35s, a crucial demographic for the Democratic Party, part of the base. And now these recent crackdowns on students, on protesters, uh, we assume... Uh, that'll drive away even more younger voters. Do you think there's a way for him to win back this crucial demographic before November? Can he win without young voters? I don't think that um, I don't think that the, I don't think that the Democratic Party, or if they can right now, I think that we are running out of space where we can win without young people, without black and brown people, and without progressives. Right? Millennials and Gen Z are we make up the largest uh, voting bloc within the electorate. And we also can't win if we don't turn out voters. So I think that we have a problem. I think that we should all be concerned. And honestly, I think that we are. I think there are a lot of people who want to pretend that we don't have concern. But we've watched the uncommitted movement now. We, we've watched what's played out in, uh, in Michigan and now other states since then. We've seen the encampments. And there is a consistent message from a lot of voters in our base, in our coalition, that they want to see a difference in direction and tone and policy regarding not just Gaza and Palestine, but they want to see it regarding foreign policy and war in general. And I think that Democrats, me included, all of us, we all have to ask ourselves, who do we serve? On whose behalf are, are, are we yeah. working? And so, who do we want to, to, to come out? So if a young person comes to you, let me ask you the same question I asked Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez very recently. If a young person comes to you and says, I'm looking at what Biden's doing, I'm looking at what's happening on campus, I'm looking at what's happening in Gaza, I'm looking at, you know, uh, multiple issues. Why should I vote for Joe Biden? What would you say to them? Yeah. I mean, young people have said that. And um, the first thing that I say is, you know, I affirm when people have those sorts of deep concerns as a black woman in this society, I've had deep concerns about politicians. Uh, I think that what I would say to them or what I would try to, to help walk through is, holistically, what are the things that we care about most? I say often that in our primaries, those are our opportunities to shape the party. And the general is our opportunity to decide what direction we want the country in. And um, helping these young people find their place in that system, helping them to find their power is a very important thing to me. And I would not want to take and strip that power from them. But helping them to work through whether or not they also want to weigh uh, racial justice, particularly for black and brown people as we see the attacks on DEI or, or our trans and our queer community as we see those attacks in not just red states but spreading across the country as we think about the, uh, the, the housing crisis that we have. What can we do to advance that? Where do we get opportunities to take a step forward and maybe not take a step back? Yeah. Uh, as a black woman, I'm accustomed to taking steps forward where we can yes. uh, instead of taking steps back. But I also recognize that it's our responsibility to earn every single vote. And we all have to be doing that. We all have to do that work. It can't just be me or AOC. It can't be Ilhan. It can't just be the squad. It has to be everybody yes. who wants to protect democracy, putting their money where their mouth is and saying that we care about democracy so much that we will actually listen to these young people who we want to vote for them. For us. You can only hope. Last question. Um, tell us about this bipartisan bill that you got through the House this week. Certainly. Um, we have, in Pennsylvania, I can speak for Pennsylvania, we have about 300,000 abandoned uh, oil and gas wells uh, in our state. Only about 27,000 of them have been identified, right? Wow. So we have a, a real need of finding them, of figuring out the most effective ways of plugging them, because it uh, causes emissions, right? These are methane emissions, but we also have concerns that they also are emitting cancer-causing uh, pollutants like benzene. So we want to make sure that we are uh, addressing the environmental issue there and the environmental concern, but also uh, the concern for our houses. We've had explosions of houses in Western Pennsylvania. So all of these kind of plan. So I'm really proud that we were able to get this obvious, you know, environmental justice bill over the finish line, bipartisan. We obviously need to get it through the Senate, but it really is a good step in saying, one, environmental issues are not partisan, shouldn't be yeah. partisan. They should 
B, you know, yes. everyone should care about them and that we can actually get something done in the 118th Congress, which was a shock. Congratulations. Thank you. Congressman Summerlee, we're out of time. Thank you so much for coming on May the Unfiltered. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.